yeah, it's great to have this event because uh, this is a fantastic topic and we have a great speakers. So uh, first I will share my screen first. I have something to give to you because uh, today's topic is very broad and then I have several key topics. So I'm going to introduce uh, what the agenda and then set the stage and then try to give you the overview of the whole topic of today. Okay, so um, as you see that we have a three really, really like important topic like AZ AI and AZ computing and then special computing and the metaverse. So this is the very, very fantastic topics. And then it's a, it's a paper <laughs> letter we require like understanding of the very basics of the technology and, and their applications. So we uh, try to cover as much as uh, relevance for that one. So based on our agenda, actually, the, we, yeah, fortunately, we have uh, three great speakers to cover in every aspect of this topic. So for example, we are going to talk about like edge computing and AGI, what, what they are and the, how they drive. And then uh, whether they uh, relate to like IoT blockchain, other digital technology, 5G or digital technology and network technology. And then we are going to talk about like uh, what, what is industry-wise uh, deployment. And then, and then we, are, we are going to understand what is special computing. Maybe some of you may be not uh, familiar with this terminology. And then we are going to talk about like uh, uh, how they actually relate to like uh, the recent, the fundamental building block of the metaverse is uh, like a reality technology. So what kind of like extended reality means that the virtual reality, augmented reality and mixed reality, whatever, all the reality technology, how they are related. And then also we are going to talk about why the uh, AGI is important for the special computing and integrate everything, right? So how they integrate to like uh, to support metaverse applications. So as I told you, we have three speakers, Angelio and Sam and then Casey Simon. So they will introduce themselves uh, when they started their talking. So we are going to have a, a, like a brief talk, a presentation as a keynote type. So each speaker to share the insight about each topics. And then we will join together as a panel, then I'm going to moderate the panel discussion. Okay, so I'm going to set the stage because uh, today's topic is so broad. So uh, first, uh, I wanted to show that uh, what is edge computing, right? Because, because Angelio is an expert, so I'm not going to touch many things. I'm just saying that uh, edge computing means that uh, you are computing and storage resources cross endpoint because you, you may think about like a, like a data centers and the central cloud center, mm -hmm. uh, like a computing. But uh, as, as we like uh, deploy more and more like end, end user device, like a smartphone or the IoT devices or the like other like uh, in the very close to the like your application point. And then we need to move our computing power to close to your like application source. So that's the one one thing. So we usually call like cloud-like computing. So they will edge cloud. And then we can think about this as a distributed computing. So distributed means that uh, your computing resources is all of the place at the edge and that they can be collaborate each other and they have uh, many uh, advantages to doing that. Maybe Angelia will cover this kind of topic. And then also they are very like uh, related to the physical computing it means that we are going to talk about the spe special computing. And in addition to special computing, we also have a physical computing that uh, I will explain more about this concept. So uh, why we think about edge AI? Yeah, definitely AI is a fundamental building for, for the intelligence application, right? So to, to include intelligence, you need a AI. And then, and then you can think about AI on the edge, right? So on the spot. So for example, the, in the smart, like a smart factory is one of the, like uh, the component of the industry 4.0. And then in a lot of like manufacturing processes ongoing in the factory level. And then if you like a uh, process something that relate to this kind of smart factories process in the cloud, they will take a lot of time because of the, the moving to the like your data to the cloud center and then and then processing back so 
is trend that uh, your computing power it will be close to your like application source and then AI will sort of onboard to the edge devices and then they will process your data to, to get the intelligence. And then also I, I mentioned that as the AI can provide like, in the distributed computing. So the like in the, uh, the most important issue with the AI is to how actually the preserve the privacy because they sometimes they are dealing with the critical data related to your privacy or something like that. So this is one way actually the AGI can provide the private security and federate learning. So this is well known in AI community about the, how you do in the federate learning through this like a distributed computing source. And also like uh, we are in Web3. So we uh, uh, try to do decentralized your like a backend data network. So do we want to be like a computing sources on the back end in the decentralized, so no central governor of the your like a govern your like a computing resources. So they are perfectly match with the blockchain based decentralization. So AGI AI is very, very important factors for even for the web three. They're, they're going to like a fundamental building for, for the metaverse. Okay, so uh then I'm going to talk about what is a special computing. So actually, the special computing is a recent topic that the actually the special computing means that extending computing power into space around us. So so maybe it's very similar concept in the ubiquitous computing, right? Ambient computing that we have a, like a long long time like a, uh have in an economic and some like a practical level but that's the one extension of the your computing power to the space so that actually the interaction with the space object and environment so you can imagine that why this is important like for example augmented reality that you interact with your space and and an object would in in overlay with your like a virtual object in the augmented reality so for example that so according to wikipedia the special computing means the digitalization of physical world to form digital representation of real world so it's, you have a very familiar with this terminology in metaverse right this metaverse is a combination combines like a physical space and world and and virtual world in a modern way so they will be fundamental building block for digitalization of your physical world to make digitalization and then they will be put into your virtual space and then they will be combined, right? And then also they are uh, more like the like uh, integrated real technology, like a VR, AR, XR devices like that. And then and the most important thing to relate to the ubiquitous uh, like uh, uh, metaverse is 3D models they can provide. They will be like a scan your world and mapping it, and then they digitalize. So they can build up the your 3D model, like environment object, is through this special computing. And then AGI is, is a very important because they will provide like contextual intelligence, means that they can understand your, your surrounding, and then they can they can be the, your intention, and then they will interact with the metaverse world in a like a cognitive and a contextual awareness. Okay, so uh, this is one thing that um, I have in mind because I, I'm, I, I'm thinking about the, uh, some, what is the best way to build up this metaverse infrastructure system. So this is one architecture. So basically uh, I've explained very shortly that um, the special computing and physical computing is a fundamental building block for the like a metaverse infrastructure. So there will be the computing uh, infrastructure and then they, they will digitalize your space and then they will put in your, your like a space to the metaverse space, right? So they are very important. And in, in additionally, that uh, there, there needs to be like network environment, like for example, 5G, 6G or whatever in the physical network. Also like, for example, they, they want to be like a decentralized and web three. So you can imagine that uh, in the metaverse in the architecture way, the front end, like like for example, you you think of our internet, the web web in, uh, like application you are doing in the World Wide Web, and today in the Web two, and then and the, you have a content, right? A content and a website. You can think about that. That will be, will be overlay to the like a metaverse world. So so two D like a website, web content will be mapping to the your three D 
and then your environmental object will be 3D and you, you join as a avatar, your metaverse world. So it will be like immersive. And then and all the object will be similar to the, your web content in the web too. And then all the, all the like uh, surrounding environment will be your individual web page you visit, right? So in the front end, what you see in the metaverse world is similar to what you have seen usually in, in the 2D website, right? And the very easy to understand, right? And then what make this happen? Special computing, right? And then what provides the, the intelligence? You know, but the intelligence means that you provide a lot of the, the friendly for like uh, experience to you is as AI, right? In the back end, and then what, what can support it? For example, Web3, like a decentralized network will be supporting this one in the back end. So this build up the complete structure of the metaverse architecture. So, so that's why the, we are very interested in the older topic, like uh, as a computing, as a AI, special computing, and the, like, uh, uh, the, how they actually relate to ubiquitous computing also like uh, uh, metaverse, right? So, uh, Having said this one, that I'm going to like uh, start to to hear from our expert insight about uh, their individual view of uh, the each company, like uh, what is the cloud, like uh, edge computing and AGI, and then and the special computing and the, how they relate to the metaverse. Okay, um, I'm going to stop my sharing. Okay, so it's time to have a, a time to hear from the great insight from our distinguished speakers. So, Angelio, you are the first. Uh, why don't you start now? Okay, thank you very much. So, I guess you should be able to see my screen. Yeah. Great. Okay, so first of all, uh, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, so, as it was mentioned by Alex before, I've been involved with edge computing. Uh, since the very beginning, and in fact, uh, to, to be completely transparent, I was part of the group that started Fog Computing. Okay, so if you ever heard about Fog Computing or the Open Fog Consortium, so I was behind that. I I, I was one of the guys that actually gave a definition to Fog Computing with some other friends at uh, at Cisco uh, almost ten years ago now. So what I'm going to do in um, um, in the following slides um, is going to well, maybe I hope it will be a little bit provocative to, to make people to, to move the, the attention, okay? Because I understand that that AI is is you know fascinating. But my point will be that uh, you know you have a brain, but there is not enough. And uh, I will uh, both make technical as well as biological analogy because I think that um, for many people, and even you know, there were some discovery on how fundamentally our um our brain is this with our in our body that are fairly recent and i don't know how many people are really aware of that and i think we should take into account these new discoveries when designing you know this when designing systems uh because you know the common assumption and vision that the brain is just here it's rather rather wrong but so without further ado let's get started and let's try to understand what are the key enablers for AGI, and then let's see how AGI you know, is key for, for the metaverse. So that will be the construction of my talk. Again, the first point I want to make, as I was mentioned before, is that in our community, you hear people talking 90% of the time about the brain, again, AI, okay? We do lots of research on algorithm, and now obviously there is increasing research on decentralized learning, but it's always about the brain, okay? The brain is absolutely fascinating and you know i'm the first one being fascinated by it but very often we forget that a brain without a nervous system is useless okay i mean just realize that and we'll get uh, to the technical analogy of it you can have the most powerful brain in the world but if your nervous system doesn't work it's really useless and it's interesting because i mean why nobody care or is fascinated by the nervous system because I mean, is humble, is there, it does it work silently and you only notice it when it doesn't work. Okay, but when it doesn't work, things get start getting very complicated. So what has this to do with the situation today? So let's get technical now. So if we look at what is happening today, the reality is that we have an increasing availability of storage or opportunity to store data 
to compute on this data and to communicate on devices that span from the data center, which might be public or private, down to our device. And um, like we saw in, in Alex's um, slides, that device could be my cell phone, could be my car. Uh, well, in, I cannot tell my watch because this is an ancient uh, tissue <laughs> mechanical. So, but anyway, you get my point, right? It could be your laundry machine. Uh, but there is really, and with 5G, this continuum, right, will get uh, um, really a continuum from you know, the potential data center, some infrastructure that, that is closer to your end device and then your device. Now, some of the premises or some of the interpretation of edge computing is that, uh, you know, you would like to draw a boundary somewhere in the system and decide what is the infrastructure, right, and up to which point computation is offloaded, and then the rest, you know, it's just potentially not so intelligent, not so capable devices. The reality is that, you know, our interpretation, I think the interpretation we should have of edge computing is that you get to pick where that edge is. So the edge might be once we will have 5G, you know, potentially um, an edge server in the 5G network, either on a, on a cell, on a nano cell or a Pico cell, whatever that provides in terms of computing capability could also be you know, the computational capability or the server that you have on your car, because you know, pretty soon we will have a data center on, on four wheels. I mean, we have been working with ARM on uh, some of their latest processor. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Ampere 80 core processor from ARM. I mean, the, the machines will have amazing potential for storing computing and uh, with 5G also uh, communicating. So you see that uh, this spectrum and this continuum uh, really gets down to, to our personal devices, and it would be really a pity not to be able to exploit it. We also need to exploit it to support certain use cases that require lower latency or that perhaps require better utilization of energy. Another point that I think we should all keep in mind, and um, it's very often you know, neglected, is that uh, power consumption is not just about data centers. Okay, data center, of course, consume energy, and it's great to have green data center. But if you look at the energy envelope, most of the energy is consumed for communication, and that has to do with physics. Uh, communicating takes far more energy than computing, and that has always been true. And uh, there are some pretty astonishing number available as far as you make a search, but I'll, I'll give you some, some pointer. So the first one, and that was you know something that got me thinking a lot, but um, some of you are maybe familiar with Despacito, uh, which is a, a video for, that uh, reached um, for the first time 1 billion views. In doing that, only for communication, okay, so distributing this video from you know, data center down to end devices, it consumed as much energy as 40,000 households in USA use in one year. I mean, this is incredible. And uh, if you think, some of the consequence of this high energy usage is because each time this video is distributed, right, is distributed from a central infrastructure or not so capillary distributed infrastructure. In other term, if myself, Alex, and um, we're sitting in, in, this, in the same room, right, and Laura were sitting in the same room, if I'm watching the video, is watching the video, and Laura is watching the video, best case we are getting in from a content caching network, but we are not sharing between us. And there are technology that will allow us to do that. So once again, we have to change the way in which we think, uh, not just because of performance, but also because of energy impact. But then the hard reality is that the existing technology you know, that represent our nervous system, right, for then supporting, for instance, AGI and everything else that requires it, which are you know, the data management technology, really falls short in dealing with data in motion, data at rest at this scale, and with providing us uniform abstraction to sharing data in motion at rest from the data center down to the device. If you pay careful attention, most of the technology available today are work well either in a cloud-centric environment or in a completely decentralized, decentralized but isolated. And that's not just good enough. And as a consequence, this severely hinders the applicability of AGI. I mean, we, we might have the best algorithms 
But until we want to have a data, you know, a, a nervous system, so a data management technology that allow us to support such brain, I mean, life would be quite complicated. And I want to give another biological uh, reason for this. So many people think that our brain is here and couldn't, you couldn't be more wrong. Because if you look at evolution, our first brain, and in this word, right, the Chinese was in the belly. Okay. And, um, uh, and in fact, uh, in the belly, we still have as many neurons as there are in a dog uh, brain or in a three years old kid. I don't know if you realize. Okay. And there are already some theory that uh, essentially explain how potentially the brain that we have here started really developing when the effort and the complexity of our digestion reduced because of the invention of, of the discovery of fire. So digestion is incredibly, increasingly uh, complicated. And as you know, we really have two brains that are actually directly connected and influence each other. But that's not enough. If you think about muscle memory or even the reaction that you have when you get burned, I mean, it's not a reaction time that comes from the brain. That's intelligence that you have built on the periphery of your system. So we have to reevaluate our understanding you know, of a complex uh, entity like human body uh, which is, you know, it seems centralized, but actually it's far more decentralized than, than we believe. And, uh, you know, what keeps everything together and working well is the nervous system. So I think we should go back, you know, and putting more emphasis on having this good nervous system to support this decentralized intelligence. And so far, you know, I think this, this has been underestimated. Um, our company is working on this, obviously, um, because we've been always, you know, sensitive and sensible to this point. I think the level of um, appreciation of the importance of this element is growing, but this will be you know, essential going forward. And now, if we move to the relationship between AGI and metaverse, I mean, I will argue that uh, metaverse, at least the, in the metaverse that is interesting from my perspective, um, will be hard to exist without some form of edge computing. And as we will see, the level of edge computing that will be required to support metaverse will depend on how much this metaverse needs to be real. And we'll get to that in a moment. But even without considering you know, the reality aspect of the, the metaverse, and I will get that in a moment, if you just consider the amount of data and the level of interaction required on the metaverse, especially when we have physical proximity, that will require um, some form of you know, good decentralization does uh, edge computing, edge AI, and so on and so forth. Then, when I, what do I mean by real metaverse? For me, real metaverse, which is the interesting thing, is really an augmented reality. Okay, it is completely immersive, and of which you could have, you know, one trillion interesting and useful application. In that case, right? Once again, think about our perception of the world. I mean, our perception of the world, in per se, is a metaverse, right? which we, we build inside ourselves. It's a representation that we build. And then the way in which we operate is that our reaction time is compatible with operating and keeping in ourselves alive in a real world, which has to satisfy the law of physics. Laws of physics have to do with time. Okay, you have to buy certain response time. I put hand of fire, I don't remove the end, my hand from the fire quickly, right? I get heavily burned, right? On, on a non-real world, that, I mean, that, that is not a real constraint uh, because this aspect of time is, is more fluid and virtual. So I think in a metaverse that really aspires to be an extension, an announcement, and uh, an augmentation of a reality, then having the ability of capillary distributed computation and AI will be essential. Um, and I think this is really where, where we should lead. So that concludes my presentation. I really wanted to give you know a, a different spin on this. I hope that was you know will uh, will um, fuel some discussion on the panel session, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Angelo. I think that you give the very good insight about uh, what will the future metaverse like infrastructure because you mentioned about like uh, the, where the energy consumed right is uh, not just for the processing but the communication. Correct. Right, and that's again, very energy, important point. And energy is super important, and people neglect that decentralization actually helps with reducing energy consumption. 
Right, because the energy consumption is directly related to the carbon emission, right? And then it Absolutely. is related to subsets, yeah, yes. sustainability. That's uh, uh, Laura and me, or another is a good, a great topic. So we are, we are even, doing even, even if we communicate over a 100 gigabit network, right? One thing is right. if one hop. One thing is if I have to make 30 or 50 hops, the energy envelope will be completely different. And this we never count for, which mm -hmm. is like cheating for me because that's where most of the cost is. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we can discuss in later, but uh, because I'm, I'm not planning that, uh, like uh, I'm not working with several other people. Usually the, my first job was telecommunication area. Mm -hmm. And then I starting from 2Z quite a long time ago in South Korea, I was a government officer to deploying 2Z and then I work for the Fuji as a government officer, and then I still working on the 5G, 6G, or something like that. They should be integrated with edge computing, right? Because uh, is uh, in the future of the metaverse infrastructure, and then, yeah. and then we also should care care about the sustainability. So I'd call it like a sustainable infrastructure. So that that's a topic that I'm going to to have a attention, and then get to some global forum next month. But uh, I thank you for your insight. It will be a great insight that I can have me to like design what will be the sustainable infrastructure architecture based on your insight. And then additionally that we have have have, have in mind that because the edge computing, it looks like in, in their uh, store, in their uh, seat on in the like a uh, physical entity like a uh, smartphone IoT, but we can think of in the metaverse in the, mm -hmm. they can be embedded in the metaverse, right? And they yeah, should. as the AI on the the like uh, metaverse means that uh, they should not be like a physical entity crowding. Maybe the like metaverse like as computing right in the metaverse mm -hmm. on, on site. So that would be the another like insight that we can have. Right? Thank you. Okay, Thank so you. next will be Sam. Uh, why don't you start now? All right. Thank, thank you, Alex. And uh, thank you, Angela. It was very good. I, I remember working with guys at Cisco 10 years ago on FOG um, back when I was at Freescale. So it's, uh, yeah, these concepts have been around a while. Absolutely. Yeah. Let me see here. Edge and cloud. Is it? Yep. Yep. Um, so I've, uh, I've been working in computing and processing semiconductors and systems for uh, several decades now. Uh, I'm currently working for FlexLogix technology around edge AI acceleration and being able to support the kind of processing that's required to support um, AI uh, type applications at the edge. There's, and I'll talk about the, the kind of new paradigms that we're, that we're engaging in here, so. Let's see if my page will advance. Uh, I grabbed a couple of pictures. Actually, this this picture of the clouds I uh, I took on my commute to uh, California last week, um, um, and uh, I just thought it was a pretty picture of, of clouds. <laughs> I wanted to share that, but I also wanted to use this to talk about kind of clouds and edges. Right? Clouds are they they are in a sense far away from the ground where the computing occurs, right? Where we engage directly, uh, more or less directly with hardware. Um, so when we talk about the edge, which yeah, I can remember talking about fog versus edge and you know, the merits of those, of those terms, but you know, the edge does represent something that's much closer to, um, to the physical environment that we're dealing with, right? It's, it's, you know, especially when we're talking about edge AI, um, you're, you care about latency, you care about the interactivity of, of the application and some things, you know, speech-based systems, clearly we can tolerate the kind of cloud latencies associated with, uh, you know, making a, a, a vocal query to a system and having that processed in the cloud and coming back at that, that level of human interaction we're, we're okay with. But when we talk about vision systems and, uh, and increasingly compute to compute systems where we actually have uh, devices that are operating in an environment um, um, and interacting with each other and interacting with people, then the importance of that latency becomes, um, becomes paramount. And uh, as Angela mentioned, the, the um, communications um, bandwidth power dissipation also come to bear. 
So, you know, if you go and look, and there are various websites, you can go and look at the latency to various cloud services. Sometimes you'll find kind of sing, single digit milliseconds. I don't think you'll ever see anything less than a millisecond, <clears throat> but kind of this um, tens to few hundreds of milliseconds are what one expects anytime you send data to the cloud. And that latency is not a round trip. That's just how long it takes to get from here to there there's processing and then there's a return trip, right? So you, so there's time it takes to communicate to clouds. Clouds are very, you know, obviously very powerful, um, but there is a latency aspect that cannot be ignored. And especially when you're talking about things like inferencing, right? If I'm inferencing um, like a, a vision-based application and I'm trying to do something at 30 frames a second, um, it's, 33 milliseconds to process one frame of image. So if I'm, you know, going to the cloud, then I'm, uh, you know, I'm already going to introduce several frames of delay um, with the, you know, the the transfer latency associated with uh, with the cloud. So that that becomes something that that people do care about you know you know i think it's always been i think everybody takes it as uh you know as a basic uh, common sense that you can't have autonomous vehicles be dependent on on a cloud for latency and just overall kind of network reliability reasons so now once you understand the latency the next thing to understand obviously is the bandwidth and what bandwidth is required and what you're paying for that bandwidth so you know, compressed video streaming, HD video, you know, when you, and it takes, takes time to compress and decompress video as well. But so assuming that you're able to compress that video, then you're looking at kind of, you know, five megabits a second, not too bad for an HD video, but, you know, over the period of one day, that's 13 gigabits. And so you start talking about, you know, you, you need to have um, gigabit, class links to support the latency and the quality of service associated with it. So, you know, a lot of cloud services like AWS, inbound data is free. You can send as much data as you want to the AWS cloud and it's essentially free. Outbound data, they do charge for. And within the, you know, system to system transfers, they charge for. And then if you were getting, you know, a business class internet gigabit link, then that's going to be about a thousand bucks a month. So there's, you know, there's there's latency, there's the bandwidth pipe sizes that you need, and then there's the cost of supporting that. So if I go look at, um, and, and I took this directly from the AWS uh, pricing page on their Elastic Inference. So Elastic Inference means, you know, it's the elastic computing with inference accelerators to do inference type processing. Um, and when we talk about inferencing, that's really the usage of machine learning or um, artificial intelligent models um, on special accelerators in the cloud. So, so to run a deep learning inference to analyze a single video screen, um, and like I said, this is straight from, from Amazon, then you're looking at um essentially 17 cents an hour for the compute instance another 12 cents for the accelerator 29 cents an hour for the use of that combination um so that's 215 dollars a month if you you know stood up a system and were using that to process something so that maybe that sounds like a lot of money or not but on an annual basis it's the cost of a fairly well um provisioned uh computing system so, you know, yeah, you, you can pay as you go, but ultimately you're going to pay for the processing um, for that. And additionally, you'll pay for bandwidth and, and other things. So it's a good, you know, it, 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 it's, it's not free to process in the crowd, cloud, I think is, is the message here. And uh, then the question is, okay, what's, where's the best place to do things? So as we, as we look at the, the edge, the challenge at the edge is that you need so much processing performance if you're doing AI type applications. So um, one, one aspect of it is the software complexity. So when we talk about machine learning models, they're very complex models. They have hundreds of layers 
and they and there's there's a lot of very specialized operations that are performed and it is not it's not software that that is you know you 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 really have difficulty no, writing no, 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 no. in uh like c you know in a c programming language so you need these more abstract languages and libraries you you're you know using things like you know python as a framework with specialized libraries to represent the operations and and then there are various mechanisms to kind of represent this this level of complexity because we are processing teraops of 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 you know trillions of operations and and there is a inherently a lot of parallelism that you cannot get access to in traditional programming environments. So you need new paradigms in terms of software to expose that parallelism and be able to map that onto the various hardware structures to to provide that. And then and then you know I'm representing a company here as well. And, and the problem we're trying to solve is how do you fit that level of processing in a power envelope and a cost envelope that makes sense at the edge? So how do you fit that, that high amount of processing and, and get that to a, to a point where, where it can be economically uh, interesting for customers to, to use? So I wanted to... <laughs> spend just a little bit of time talking about this concept of of terra ops and and uh and angelo is you know he had zeta ops zeta ops is a couple of a couple of uh several orders of magnitude maybe 10 orders of magnitude beyond where we are in terra ops but if we think about um the the lot of amount of processing that's required you know we could we could sit here and count seconds and we know what that is you know a million seconds is about two weeks a billion seconds is about 32 years and a trillion or a terasecond is like 32,000 years so if you if you we're, we're very comfortable with the transition we've made in computing technology from kind of the mega scale to the giga scale which is where we live now most most processors run in gigahertz and there's some parallelism that'll get you to you know tens of gig, the gigahertz of uh, of performance or tens of giga operations of performance but to really get to terra ops and beyond you have to you have to have different architectural approaches now fortunately the terra ops that we're talking about have highly regular structures and are able to be exploited with uh, with a lot of uh temporal and well a lot of real spatial spatial parallelism um, there is a temporal sequentiality to them. In other words, there's a whole lot of parallelism that you can take advantage of, but you can't do everything all at once. There's a, there are these, these layers that you pass data between that require, um, that, that require things to be completed in a certain order, but, but it is an aggregate Terra ops. And especially if you're trying to fit it in a headset or you're trying to fit it into, um, something that you know is able to sense an environment a real-time environment you've got to shrink that down in something that's very very efficient um so I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about kind of what we're we're doing to to try to solve that problem which i think is an important problem to solve when we talk about the metaverse and the sensing so, so there's two aspects of, of metaverse. If we're talking about metaverse, hopefully we're talking about something that's going to be fun and engaging, you know, not the not the matrix, more like the oasis. Um, something to be fun and engaging, but you've got to be able to move a lot of processing performance very close to the user for the latency discussions that we just had, especially in the interaction with the environment, right? So the the uh, the sensing of the local environment and then the rendering of that uh, of that information right so whether that's through graphics processing units or other things we do see essentially that the processing for the gpu and the processing for the inferencing are different you know you can use gpus for inferencing it's not that not that efficient to do that and then and there are other structures that are much more efficient for inference level processing and we're not even talking about the training aspect 
of these machine learning models, which we think of is, is mostly a cloud problem. But the concept is that you're able to significantly reduce the um, the size of the of the pro of the processing required to create um, silicon solutions that are able to run the software um, required at this. And so, in a comparison base, I think this is my last slide here. The comparison is that I can you know versus an Nvidia. Um, GPU processor, I can kind of process more performance at a with a much smaller piece of silicon, and that much smaller piece of silicon directly translates to saved um, cost and lower power, and and the ability to use that into much um, you know kind of much more much smaller systems because of that because the powers the power is lower the cost and and the requirements are lower so that's kind of what i wanted to to bring to the to the party here so to speak is the is that as we move to um talking about metaverse we have to recognize that the that the processing the computing which i i think of as a more general purpose right data data processing computing uh, and then the 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 inference processing or the graphics processing will become more and more specialized in order to interface at the edge, you know. And then and then you'll have you'll have this uh, set of um, you'll have this set of computing resources at you know moving up to the cloud that will have more and more power, more and more connectivity. But as you get close to the edge, the most of the processing will be focused on the the direct interfacing with the you know kind of individuals or other devices there at the edge. So that's uh, that's my two cents. Hopefully we can we can discuss some more um, in the in the panel. Thank you, Sam. I think that that's a great insight because uh, because of realization on the metaverse will not be happened without like a supporting infrastructure, and then the, your like uh, innovation is very essential to to have uh, at the edge. Uh, we need to like computing power to like supporting, and especially the the it was a uh, fascinating actually the the you can think about the current like uh, Nvidia GPU. Because I'm using my computer is a game machine, so I have a GP like a 11 gigahertz uh, like a GPU inside of my computer, and how bulky it is you now. And then and so we needed some kind of GPU type processing at the as and then I I fascinated by your your like innovation to bring that the attention to that. Okay, so next will be Casey Simon. So he is an expert in special computing. So next our site move it to from like edge computing to special computing. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and really, really lovely these last two um, introductions, I think really set the stage well. Um, yeah, so I'm based at the, the Technical University of Delft where I'm a researcher of spatial computing. Um, and I wanted to kind of just really address <laughs> what spatial computing is. Um, so as a researcher, what I look into is how uh, spatial computing is created from the engineering all the way through the design side. So I try and make sense of the processes and methodologies that go into creating spatial computing artifacts um, so that we can actually create new kind of ways for this industry to move forward in methodological rather than kind of, um, yeah, it's a little, Frankensteinish right now, which is exciting, right? It means there's a lot of innovation, but it also makes it hard to track um, where we're going, where we want to go, and how to evaluate it. So I kind of compressed a, a talk that I like to give on kind of the very brass tacks of what is spatial computing down, um, and then added on a little kind of addendum about like how does this exist in the metaverse and thinking about um, bringing the computing power indeed away from the cloud and into the edge as a kind of core need, I would say, of spatial computing. Um, so perhaps you guys are familiar with the concept of computing waves. Computing waves are kind of a term that get thrown around a little, uh, I don't know, rough and tumble, <laughs> and they emerged in the 90s. Um, I think Alex was saying earlier that he was even involved in kind of early conversations about ambient intelligence. And so Mark Weiser is 
kind of uh, is people say that he started this term, but it's a little unclear. In any case, in the 90s, you'd start talking about computing waves and computing waves uh, come from a thought about innovation waves, which came from a Russian um, economist who was noticing that when innovation comes about, they happen in cycles and they happen at a, at a, at a certain rate that kind of has a peak and a valley like a wave. Um, and here we have uh, the same phenomenon happening with computing technologies and they're broken down by the amount of users um, use any single type Type of computing device simultaneously. Of course, our very first computer, the mainframe computer, <laughs> kicks off the computing wave and really never hits even close to a billion devices on Earth at any single time. And it's really one computer, many users, and it has currently very few functions. So I've done quite a lot of research and they do still exist <laughs> and they are still produced because they're quite expensive. So if you've invested in one, good reason to keep it around. Of course, we move into desktop computers um, in about 30 years later. And this kind of brings the idea of where can computers be into question and starts really a new revolution. You can see an interesting kind of dent here in the mid 2000s where these desktop computers actually go down in sales per year. Um, I wonder if any of you guys can think what the reason is for the uptick. It turns out it is gaming. So desktop computers do still have a very active function in our current computing infrastructure and probably will maintain one, unlike the mainframe, which we will see. <laughs> and then we move into ubiquitous computing and Alex did indeed mention this as well. I find this advertisement incredible as if all of us were gonna lug literally a piece of luggage to work just to have a personal computing device. But of course in the eighties, what we see happen is that the power of computing is changing in a way that okay, theoretically, sure, we could have more computers serving a single simultaneous user. Of course, you have your phone, your tablet. We know the story where this goes. Servers are also seen as their own independent computing wave. It is incredibly challenging to get accurate numbers on how many servers there are on the globe in the globe right now um, because you know <laughs> of politics, etc. But the function of a server, as we all know, is to, yeah, many computers, many users simultaneously. Why do I think this is important? Well, the term ubiquitous computing, pervasive computing, spatial computing, mobile computing, these all get thrown around kind of together. Hello. <laughs> and um, they all have distinct meanings and also, importantly, a little bit of overlap. Um, and so the, the distinction between pervasive computing or mobile computing or spatial computing is, is not, oh, is this okay, Matilda? Okay, dogs and children. Um, so yeah, there are, there's some blurry edges and, um, so something can be a pervasive computer while it's a mobile computer. And we'll talk a little bit more about those distinctions and how they work. So in practice, what we found, um, is that this turns out to be a pretty work, good working definition. And it's interesting. I know one of our earlier speaker, Angelo was talking about using biological metaphors as well. So the working definition we use is spatial computing is extraceptive computing comprising of an array of software and hardware working in tandem to track events in real Euclidean space. So extraceptive might be a term that's new for some of you. Um, it does indeed go back to biology. And so biological organisms have interoceptive, extraceptive, and proprioceptive capacities. Um, interception being the ability to kind of be internally self-aware, conscious or non-conscious. Um, things like knowing your heart rate, um, which we don't really have as humans a conscious awareness of, but of course that is happening. Proprioception is your awareness in space. So that's your equilibrium, balance, et cetera, kind of having a sense of distance. And your extraception are basically the majority of your five senses. So your awareness of the environment. And so in this way, we can kind of group all, you know, spatial computing things into this definition that the computer itself is aware of its environment intentionally um, and centrally, whereas something like a desktop computer, right, is actually more aware of its own internal environment as the computing goal. Okay, so another nested category um, within spatial computing. So there's a lot to digest here in terms of images, but often when folks talk about spatial computing, they talk about it in terms of this kind of vague difference between clear, we all know VR is, right? That is a clear separate thing, but then we get into AR, MR, XR, and the lines get blurry. Is that what the metaverse is? Is it the seamless movement between the three? So in my research, I like to look at it actually in terms of mobility of the spatial computing artifacts. 
So on our automobile category, we have things like drones. Snap just released a new drone that takes a selfie. Okay, maybe a limited use case, but we're starting to see that, yes, this is a tiny computer with a lot of extroception, a lot of awareness of its environment, and the task is quite small. Take a picture. We also have our Roombas, of course, or startups like Ukes, which are um, self-driving uh, vehicles. Your mobile is an interesting category because the way that it becomes mobile mostly is just through the use of human you know, movement. So by wearing augmented reality glasses, I've created a mobile computer that is a spatial computer or just using my mobile computer, <laughs> a, a tablet or a phone, I've created an augmented reality experience like with Pokemon Go or here we're, we're at the um, Apple store. And then VR is a clear kind of, it is spatial computing for two reasons. And I don't think most people don't refer to the to the three dimensional like visual element of a VR headset as spatial computing, but some people do. But importantly, the movement tracking to help you be naturally in in the experience of VR that is very very much spatial computing. And then the immobile um, is an interesting paradigm where you kind of are more relying on an array of hardware to together create the the. the paradigm of spatial computing. So something like an Amazon Go store is every single sensor itself spatial computing, possibly, but possibly it's computer vision. Um, and that happens later in the software side and not in the hardware side. And so this gets blurry again. But in any case, these are fixed uses of spatial computing. So yeah, how do we want to <laughs> get into spatial computing. Um, well, this morning or the last 24 hours, Figma, which is for those of you who are not familiar, um, Figma is a kind of new competitor to the Adobe suite of uh, graphic design products. Um, so they they had a conference and this is Bill Gikaran and he is the head of um, IKEA Smart Home Smart. Um, and he said, you know, what, what do we do when the internet fails in our smart homes that we've created, you know, beautifully designed, um, now the internet's gone, how do you access your home? I think this is a, this is a really real question um, and the reality of do we send it all the way up to the cloud? Well, it doesn't work when the internet goes out. How do you turn on the lights? Your immediate use cases, of course. Um, and I thought it was interesting, the two earlier speakers were kind of asking, well, where actually is this edge? Is it at the device level? Is it at the node level? Is it right on the edge of the cloud level, right? These are different places. And I think that's gonna be a very, uh, and what we're finding in our research is it's a very important question for engineers and designers alike to have a really clear grasp on because otherwise they're kind of designing and stabbing in the dark and creating protocols that maybe actually don't have fail safes built in. So when we go back and look again at this kind of assortment of technologies, my sense is that this is the metaverse and it's the interaction between these things in a seamless way that allows us to access the metaverse, less so than the kind of central VR idea that once you're in that digital space, you're in the metaverse. I think uh, certainly as we're discussing it today, it's really about this transition between these objects. So yeah, hopefully that was a nice little semantic conversation, but glad to glad to be more, yeah, at the interstitial hereafter. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great insight because uh, first that uh, uh, you mentioned about like uh, is a, a migration of, of the ubiquitous computing to the special computing is very important, right? And then also like uh, we are living in the special, right? So we are in in a special. So Schumann is adapted to be special. So I think that the special computing is a natural way to supporting our like uh, inside of about the environment and our interaction with the object. And the other thing that you point out, uh, like a uh, scene is like uh, like a move move around like virtual space to real space through the, like a mixed reality type, right? Because that's very that's very important. And then you provide a very very good like a uh, good example about the, what the future like life in a metaverse, right? For example, the, you have a, like a like a XR XR device type glass where, right? And then have a they have a like a to communicate with uh, like ambient with like a uh, get tap the computing power like like in the like edge computing and then and then they will be seamlessly move for example you if you move around like a shop and then they will overlay with your like physical shop around to your like a butcher shop for example that uh, if you look at the, some some product and then they will provide like information and butcher information and what what the like uh, 
for example, they're, they're linked to the web web three NFT, and then you have a bonus if you if you have a, like a, a buy there or something like that. So it will be give you like a completely mods between the real space and the virtual space in the seamlessly like crossover, right? For example, if you if you are in the in the home and then if you like uh, wear the, this kind of the extra device and if you're looking at the like for example your TV, right? And then again you can control through the, your device. Is a physical control, but also you can you want to move into the virtual space and you can control your physical TV in the virtual space through this special computing. So that's that's a very very great like a concept that we need to have it. Okay, so having said that, uh, we actually the almost time to like uh, to move into the next stage. So we are going to uh, like uh, join with our 3 dc speaker as a panel, and then and then we are going to, for example, that uh, I think we like like active participants. So we will have uh, like a question from the audience to share your comment idea or the some of the question. And if you have a pinpoint of some speakers, you can do that. So I I want you to participate in actively. And also, like, uh, if don't if you don't have any question, then we'll we'll discuss about the in the general this topic that we we introduce in in the agenda. So uh, why don't you participate? Like, uh, we have a several question in already in the chat window, but uh, you can talk directly, and then and then you can share your idea or comment or question. Is there anyone to talk about? Because for example, Diana, you you mentioned about like uh, IBM has just developed a chip embedded with AI. What impact would have on the metaverse and the edge computing? Maybe the Sam, Sam will be the the person maybe the answer for that. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's a it's an interesting question. I, I think the reality is that uh, that that most chips most processing solutions will have a combination of uh, general purpose you know kind of core based processing plus ai acceleration if you look at all of the the the, the chips that apple makes for their iphones they're 100 percent penetrated on ai acceleration in addition you know they have arm cores that they use to run ios run the you know essentially all of the management of the phone but they've added special acceleration blocks designed specifically to um, offload this uh, the mathematics required to do um, to do AI processing and the same way they have GPUs to do the, the screen based processing. So it, it's it's really emerging as a new form of processing. There's still there's still a lot of innovation in that space and we haven't yet settled on what are the the, the long term winning strategies. And so, so there's, you know, there's still a lot of people trying to figure out how to, how best to solve these problems and the models that the, the AI applications themselves continue to evolve. So, so in a sense, you're kind of chasing, a, chasing moving target. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it is very much the case, though, that the processing required um, is uniquely is, 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 um, is unique enough and different enough from general purpose processing that it will be, uh, you know, there will be special silicon acceleration techniques that are applied um, to do it because it's just not a. Hey, Alex, I've got a quick. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, thank you for the, the presentation oh, today. Um, quick introduction. Very, very inefficient. I'm sorry, did I, did I speak over the top of you? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I was just wrapping up. Go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you uh, for that. Um, I'm a global principal at Equinix. Um, Equinix being a global, large global um, data center interconnection company. Quick question for the panel. Um, if we were to think about the, the and plot a time horizon as to when and how long the community, the world, the markets, could take advantage of this type of, you know, pervasive edge computing. Um, what what kind of time is is that? It, you know, just in in the sense of developing and really being 
pervasively available. Um, I just don't have a good sense of how long that's going to take for adoption. I'd be happy to kick off an answer for that. I think, unfortunately, the answer is it's going to happen gradually over time. Um, which is to say certain things are already capable of it now and uh, the interconnectivity element is going to probably take like, several decades to figure out in any meaningful capacity. So maybe I can clarify the question back to you, which is what kind of paradigm are you meaning when you're talking about this, this fully immersive, uh, pervasive type of computing? What's the vision that you're speaking to? Well, yeah, that's, a, that's, that's another, you know, great, great point. Um, you know, I'm a member of the Evolving Edge team here at Equinix, so this is the types of things that uh, that we spend a lot of time thinking about. And and as we did here, we we open up every conversation with the definition of the edge from multiple different points of view. Um, so the the edge is defined by all of the different uh, uh, stakeholders and participants. And so I think you know my vision of of this tends to get become sort of a a, a blended um vision for what um applications or what you know use cases um get get implemented and and i'm not looking for a common denominator i'm looking for what we're looking to do is to ensure that uh, that folks can take advantage of the things that we're doing um to to meet the the widest um uh, the widest amount of use cases today and be prepared to agilely take advantage of the advancements and the evolutions that take place over that that long you know time horizon. Yeah, are you familiar with this the Spatial Web Foundation? Um, so they're working to create part protocols with um, W three for spatial web connectivity. So I think following some of the kind of most immediate use cases that they're actually creating, like well, not legislative but body controls around. Uh, what to create protocol for might be an interesting way of kind of following what can we do right now and what is being yeah prepared to do at scale. Um, yeah, that would be, but I'm curious what the rest of the panel would say. Yeah, so I, I think there are solutions, at least for what concerns the, the data plane, there are solutions that are emerging. And uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Edge Native Working Group um but uh, we have at least uh, one technology that was designed precisely to address the problem that we're discussing uh this is called uh, it, it's a pro an open source project called e eclipse zeno and the bottom line uh, okay uh, for those that are not familiar maybe i'll, I'll, I'll give a, a quick idea but the bottom line what we managed to do is to try to merge the best um let's say you know experience that we had in uh, protocols for dealing with data in motion like PubSub, but PubSub that could span from a microcontroller uh, and to work on a very constrained network and constrained hardware up to the data center and you know saturate a hundred gigabit network uh, with NDN protocols. I don't know how many of you are familiar with NDN protocol, but that comes from the NGI initiative, so next generation internet. And those were protocols on how to query data that is situated on geodistributed data storages. So this really integrates that in motion that addressed as well as computation from the data center down to the microcontroller. And I think it's really the fabric that uh, is used. And there are quite a few European and initiative around the world that are building on top of this technology uh, to, uh, to do AGI. So check it out. It's called Eclipse Zeno as a project. It's open source and uh, you know there is a forum on uh, uh, Discord that, that where you can uh, can ask question and there will be by memory the first user summit both in person and uh, virtual on the 16th of uh, of June. So this will be announced soon, but it will be in Paris. Okay, but you still can attend either in the beautiful Paris or or virtually. Thank you. Uh, I think Nodri. Oh, uh, I think that the. Oh, uh, you maybe uh, attend my next webinar is about the metaverse infrastructure building. I think that the, what you mentioned about a really, really important like a, a conference to build up the like a metals infrastructure, especially related to the special computing and edge computing. So I will invite you. OK. OK, so um, next will be um, I will have Amit Kumar. Are you there? Because uh, uh, his question is not a comment about like uh, 
uh, he, he, he mentioned about the full blown metaverse experience coming in a few years from now. So I'd like to hear from you that uh, why you think about this. All right, so, uh, hey, this is uh, Amit, Amit Kumar. And uh, yeah, so, you know, essentially when the metaverse term came in, uh, everybody said, you know, it's VR. It's just, you know, coining it as metaverse. And, mm -hmm. you know, a uh, lot of us said that, you know, uh, VR didn't fly that much. So they had to put up a new term out and, you know, have technologies around it. And, uh, you know, essentially uh, VR as, as uh, we cannot see metaverse as VR, you know, because metaverse is not just VR, it is going to expand beyond VR. And uh, it will be more like, you know, uh, where it's not just going to be virtual, but it will be real virtual together. That would be metaverse. So uh, when, when we see that happening, you know, all these new, my comment over there on the chat was more on the IBM hardware that was launched as a question where the IBM chips, the SOCs are now happening you know, uh, AI capability and all that, right? So uh, I think a lot of uh, AR and VR experiences that we would see in future, you know, uh, they would definitely be benefited by all these shifts on the uh, edge compute side, but it, it's still going to be time, you know, a lot of solutions are evolving at this stage. For a full blown metaverse experience where AR and, and VR and, you know, uh, connected, uh, you know, computing where human and machines are working together in tandem, these things, you know, they'll take too many new technologies to, to bring a full blown metaverse experience, you know? So uh, I, I would say that, you know, uh, my, my take is that all these ships can be really helpful in thinking about new solutions and people can look at all uh, ends of the spectrum, right from uh, the end compute side to the, to the, you know, edge compute side and also the hardware, you know? Today, if you see, there are only a few hardware companies who are making hardware for VR and the same applies for AR, right? So I think uh, if, you, if you see where we are going from here, the experience would, the whole, when I say metaverse experience, like it has to be seamless. Like if I am using the metaverse or I'm in the metaverse, I should barely be able to figure out whether it's real or, or, or not real, right? So I think it's still time for that to happen, but in the, in the interim, there'll be too many new things that will be coming in. And these uh, IBM chips and, the other companies which are releasing the new socks on, which have a blocks of AI and everything else on it, they are just uh, a starting point. You know, I would say that's that's what I was uh, that is what I was talking about earlier on my comment. Thanks, I mean, Actually, the, you you get the point about the like uh, experience because uh, because just yesterday I published my article about the metaverse experience, so it was a timely question, and then and then inside, yeah. Because, uh, because for example, the Gartner evaluated, like for example, by year 2026, the at least one hour every every people will be uh, stay in the metaverse, enjoy something with the metaverse experiences. So uh, it's yeah. So how actually the fully grown metaverse experience is not yet, but uh, the important thing is that everything should be support like uh, infrastructure, like hardware, software, and then also like uh, how we actually design the, the providing the, this kind of the matter experience is very, very key point. And so I think the, the all the effort we did, we did the effort into giving to the like, uh, to how integratively provide this kind of the matter experience. So I, I thank you for your the good point. Okay, there's so one thing more, uh, there's mm -hmm. one thing more, Alex, you know, I would, what I was saying is that, you know, I think uh, metaverse from, from my perspective, it's totally my perspective, I think it's mostly going to change the dynamics of entertainment, what mm -hmm. people want to have as entertainment in their lives, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at all the latest, you know, uh, web content that is coming in or the web series and stuff like that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, content like upload, which is coming on Amazon Prime, you know, all these things talk about a virtual world, you know, where you are real yourself, but then you can, you know, enjoy the things that you can not do otherwise, you know? So mm -hmm. I may not be a good basketball player myself, but in a metaverse, I can be Michael Jordan if I want to be, right? Mm -hmm. So I can get those skills and I can play basketball over there. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of this stuff is very exciting. And this mm -hmm. also would be changing the way we will be living in the next few years from now, because mm -hmm. instead of just hanging out with friends, having hang sodas and beers, we would be hanging on the metaverse and, and maybe just meeting people over there, you know, and finding new connections. So mm -hmm. things are exciting. And I think all this new hardware change, all the hardware changes, and even the quantum computing that is coming in, 
few years from now, it's still very experimental at this stage. But as soon as this really goes mainstream, we will have a, a new world altogether, I would say, around us. You know, it will mm -hmm. be not what we see today, but it will be very different from what it is today. So mm -hmm. uh, with that, I just... Uh, keep yeah, that's, that's a great else. point. You know, you know that the, the, what you talk about is that in the conceptually means that the, in a, in a, like for example, the butcher space, the butcher world is consists of the like a time and the matter and then and then place, right? So it is 3D and then there is a 3D object environment and then the timeless. So we call like a, they will democratize your world, right? And then and then for example that uh, you, you mentioned about you can you can be anything in the virtual space right and then additionally that the the casey simon talk about if they they can be connect to your real life right in the in the physical world it will be it will be add more values and they better be great power and then that's why we need a special computing right because that's that will bring you enable password to be connect to your virtual space and and real space so that's a great point. Okay, so we will move on to the next one. Is a uh, uh, let Letna D uh, talk about what is the biggest block for the special company to take off and become mainstream? Maybe the yeah, Casey Simon, the question for you. <laughs> sure. Um... That is a good question. I mean, I think it, it kind of goes back to Rodney's question as well, which is what do we mean for these technologies to hit full stream? I mean, um, the vision is really, really grandiose and really, really all encompassing to bring mobile technology into our reality was kind of a more discreet goal. Um, we have devices that fit in our hands, in our bags, and have very discrete use cases as well. I mean, I think at the end of the day, you can boil down what mobile devices can do to accessing the internet and taking photos, which is one of the kind of those I would say are kind of the biggest use cases, maybe having a security object on your person to, to keep on touching and be like, oh, I'm still connected. Um, spatial computing is so much more vast, right? We have the integration from our your drones, personal drone assistance to robots cleaning your floors and maybe bringing you things in supermarkets. Walmart has a, a manager um, robot which goes to the store and checks the stock. Um, and then we have self-driving cars. We have um, fully immersive environments. So Amazon Go is a concept where you can walk into a supermarket and walk out without ever checking out because all of the computer vision actually monitors who you are, keeps it attached to your account and lets you walk out of the store. Um, yeah, how does that become main? It, is that whole vision all becoming true in every single context, which is to say, is a school completely like an Amazon Go source? You grades aligned over 17 different years um, and every single piece of homework that you ever turned in be attached to you in some meaningful way. Um, yeah, that's gonna be really hard and really far away. So um i think probably just like mobile technology the first thing is like is it working well does it feel good to use people didn't have a ton of roombas when they were kind of not really reliable and you had to go back and vacuum up your floor again so when we have these experiences that get increasingly easy to use more of it will happen and this has a lot to do with what angelo and sam of course was speaking to which is like how do we literally make that happen in terms of both the hardware and processing capacity so they're working in tandem i think long answer thanks okay so next oh diana you have another question why don't you have a you feel to have a question diana are you there Okay, so Diana's question is about the, like, uh, for example, uh, yeah, you can go ahead because uh, we want to be at this participate. Yeah. Oh, you you moved now. Yeah. Oh, you're on mute. Diana, you are on mute. Okay. Yes. Um, the 2020 Red Hat conference this week focused on the importance of open source. What impact does this have on the metaverse? and edge AI computing? That's my question. So could, do you mind repeating the second part? Because I, uh, on my side, yeah, I cut yeah. out. Um, obviously, the, the importance of open source systems and what impact does this have on the metaverse and edge AI computing? 
Yeah, so maybe I can take that. Okay, so I've been working. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, because again, there are really, I think, an, an hidden part to your question, which is open source or standards or both yes. of them. Okay. And again, let me give at least my perspective. I, I worked on standard. In fact, even one of the standards is at the foundation of the European Air Traffic Control Management. So for almost 20 years. Brilliant. A, yes, really, <laughs> really. <laughs> and uh, at some point, I kind of got a little bit fed up because um, of most of two things. Um, the, the impedance mismatch that there is between standardization and um, I would say innovation and the pace of innovation in software, okay? And the second one is the inherent aspect of ossification uh, that are due to, you know, legacy and, uh, and uh, vendor uh, implementing standard and eventually not wanting to change. So my personal view, and I think this is what, what we're doing also with, with, our, with our company, is that the way forward is absolutely open source for multiple reasons, because uh, is the way to innovate, is the way to uh, make sure that uh, you are completely open. So open with respect uh, uh, to you know, interoperability, open with respect to ensuring that it's fully transparent what you are doing, right? And I think that would be completely open. And open with respect to uh, making sure that uh, uh, you, know, you can integrate um, end user feedback quickly and ensure that end user have more control in, I mean, technology end user in uh, controlling the evolution of your technology. I mean, uh, in standard often is vendors who dictate and end user to some extent, you know, get the consequence of what vendors decided. In open source, I think that the concept of end user innovation and user driven innovation is much easier to, to implement and engage if you have a good community. So from my perspective, you know, the key of open source will be essential. And, um, um, and again, I mean, um, this is what we believe. This is actually what we are trying to, to make. As you know, there are a few important initiatives trying to push um, um, uh, edge, well, try to facilitate edge infrastructure. Um, Red Dot is quite active in, in this aspect. And one of the elements actually we didn't touch upon yet is security, okay? So, and security from different aspect. Uh, let me at least quote two. One is, once again, uh, you know, recently we had an assessment of one of the technology we implemented that is open source against seven proprietary implementation, and we ranked by far the best in terms of security. It's an open report from a security firm. So once again, you have the proof that as open source is under the ivory one, you know, uh, you have nothing to hide and you better fix your bugs, right? That still gives better security. Second point is that for anything that has to do with communication, 70% of the exploit come from memory management issues. So even the programming language that we will use for next generation infrastructure, I think it's essential. There is way too much C, C++ around. And I think, you know, at least in, in our case, this is where we see the future going, but there are some evidences also for automotive software, programming languages that are performant and safe, like Rust, will be essential going forward. And this is what we are betting on. And there are interesting signals. I mean, even if you look at the future of automotive, Rust was recently, a, a working group on Rust was recently announced by Autosar. I mean, automotive is one of the most conservative domain and they just announced two weeks ago that now they have a working group on Rust. And uh, yeah, so I think there are multiple innovation coming from open source and open source will eventually be a big, en a way, a big enough wave no, that uh, on which AGI will be able to really serve. Thank you so much. That's really impressive. And um, I started 20 years ago as well. So <laughs> it's good to share, the, to share that knowledge. Yeah. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Diane. Thank you, Diana, Angelo. It's a great question and great answer. OK, so next one, uh, Lidoy, uh, why don't you participate? Hello, this is Rudoy from Bangladesh. I'm only 24 years old and learning Metaverse NFT blockchain, a lot of things together. So my question is that we can uh, carry our phone whenever 
we go out or we can use a phone while walking but for vr we can't use it uh, on the on road we need a special place to uh, to use it and also it's a very difficult to carry i have to take a new bag on my shoulder to carry a vr that's so what could be the solution for this Are you familiar with um, Facebook's Aria glasses or Project Aria? Uh, I believe it's called. I I, uh, I know about a glass called Nubella. Nubella glass, which is uh, compact and we can carry this, but that is not developed very well. And mo most of the people are focusing on the VR only, and VR is not a compact device. It's very hard to carry, and I, most of the people like me. I cannot use my headphone for a long time because it attached to my head. And VR also is a heavy thing on the head, right? So how can we overcome this solution? Yeah, well, I think um, people are not, there's a great um, video from the Washington Post where a, a journalist tries to spend 24 hours in the metaverse and essentially she's wearing an, an Oculus for those 24 hours. And of course she gets a headache just from, from the weight of the device. So yeah, this is a clear and a known um, challenge for the device type. And this is why augmented reality glasses, augmented reality contacts will likely be kind of the future of virtual reality. So with augmented reality contacts, you could close your eyes and have a virtual reality experience just from you know the shutting of your eyes, creating that black backdrop. Um, so yeah, kind of just with all computing devices, they get smaller <laughs> and more transportable kind of the farther they go. I, I would say that that's probably, it's probably just time um, before the challenge that you're speaking to gets addressed. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And then, yeah. by the way, so there is something we are forgetting, right? Because we don't have just uh, hearing and uh, uh, seeing. Of mm -hmm. course, we have to talk about touch. How about smell? Yes. Mm. Right? Don't underestimate smell because smell is fundamental for evoking memories when you don't realize, but sometimes you recognize people by smell. You actually, I mean, so. Uh, I think we have to be very careful in, uh, I mean, we have a fantastic world and uh, we have five cents or actually more, depending on some, some latest research. But the point is, I think we shouldn't create a metaverse, which is just a way of escaping the real life because real life sucks, yeah. okay? It should be, I would say, an augmented reality because there are some good use cases for that. And again, technology should be at the service of the human, shouldn't be used to enslave human or as a way of escaping reality because <clears throat> your reality sucks and it's easier you know, to, to be Djokovic in virtual reality as opposed to train for real. You see what I mean? Because in that we will collectively lose. Yeah, I think what you're saying is... What you're saying is really important, Angelo, that... Um more senses. So I think people often talk about all of these visual uh, devices as the metaverse, but we, well, I, uh, I don't know if I see anybody else wearing headphones, but these are you know, noise canceling in ear uh, headphones. How are they not augmented reality, right? I'm actually hearing myself and you through a microphone and it is augmenting my reality through digital, uh, through digitization, through computing. Um, and so smell, of course, will be, I see somebody already put that in the comments, probably the most challenging of uh, of these things to actually do in a, in a controlled uh, delivery, but all of the other senses are things that um, we already are doing in many ways, right? Uh, people with uh, implants for their hearts, et cetera, that's a type of augmented reality. Um, you are working with a device in order to be here in this world. So yeah, maybe you bring up a really interesting point, like what is the conception of reality that we're trying to augment or meta <laughs> with all this additional technology? In the ANC, I cannot uh, continue with active the ANC for two hours. It also makes headache. It's a UX problem in the Apple, Apple airports, I believe. Mm -hmm. It also makes headache if, if I use this for two hours with ANC activation. But if I use this without ANC, I can use for four, five hours easily. Yeah, and yeah. 
So may, maybe we'll move to something like Neuralink, where we'll just bypass our our senses directly, and we can plug into our spinal cortex, and that'll be the solution. <laughs> well, but see, I, I, I that's interesting. I mean, that poses a totally new challenge, which is you know, every all, both of you both talked about you know biology and the human body to a certain extent. I think this jump to wanting to do even uh, Facebook just recently came out with like a, a muscle um, device that can basically feel tiny electrical movements in your muscle as indication of touching a button or wanting to right um, as an impulse before the cognition yes. of the actual user was you know, ready to actually say that is what I would have done. So that precognition, we can create devices that are actually aware of our precognition. Like what does the world look like that computing can act on precognition? Um, it seems, yeah, <laughs> like jumping the gun perhaps a little bit, but I'm curious what you think of that, um, Sam. Wow, we, we are very in the different level about the sensation reality, and then we need to touch the brain science. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah, well frankly, so, yeah. most yeah, most of the stuff freaks me out. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I do see. I mean, I do think there are real challenges with the current meta metaverse VR technology. That you know, they do. They they're not comfortable. They're not you know they're not natural. And you know, just like three D TVs, right? We all step back and just said, just give me a bigger TV. Um, and uh, and we do have an ability to immerse ourselves in what we're doing. I mean, when people are playing video games and things like that, whether it's VR or not, they they are immersed. And and I think I think we should think about um, you know our our minds the way they work. They will become very focused and immersed without having to completely um, shut off. You know other senses and other things because we we will focus on what we're interested in and what we're focused on um so i would i would say that i you know at least in my perspective i think that the that uh, it's more likely that a metaverse not be um 100 immersive that it be something that allows us to engage with it um, and yet engage with the real world in a more seamless way. I think that's going to be the winning ticket near term until some of these other problems of, uh, of biological interfacing get solved better. Wow, we can, we can keep going on this great discussion, but unfortunately we are almost time to end. So I will take one more question. And then, and then you can you can yeah contact the individual speakers and maybe in the future we have another maybe event similar like this, because uh, um, on, unfortunately because of our topic is really, really fantastic but a uh, lot of people cannot recognize right so we need to share this record and, and then you know, let them know that how the wonderful this topic so I will take a, a one more final one is uh, uh, equip. I think that I like that uh, final because uh, I was a great debate this morning about uh, his question is uh, mathematics. Is metabus equal VR augmented reality and question, right? It's a mess, right? The reason I, I raised this question is this morning, actually, one of my LinkedIn connection in the metaverse expert, he, he mentioned that he, he, he put the mathematics, like, uh, for example, metaverse is not equal Web3. Because recently a lot of people confused about like the Web3 as a metaverse. And I say that, yes, it's, it's awkward, but uh, it's, it's okay. But I'm also uh, put on my mess is that the metaverse equal Web3 plus special computing plus other AI plus plus plus, because it, it depending on how you build uh, your metaverse, right? So yeah, definitely metaverse. It's not exactly the VR women's reality, but the data will be the part of the metaverse. So, so uh, maybe uh, that that maybe there's some answer that uh, to your question. If you if you have any specific question, you can you can do it. Eclipse, not here. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, we have a wonderful discussion. We can we can keep going on because we have great speakers and then they, they have like in the deep level understanding. So yeah, we can keep going on. But unfortunately, 
uh, we need to stop now and then I will uh, pass over to Laura to wrap up. Well, I think um, the conversation was absolutely engaging. Thank you very much to everyone for your words and what your thoughts. I, I just invite everyone to participate in uh, uh, in uh, in a tribe, but probably we should uh, open up a, a tribe exactly for HAI because it's it looks um, it looks and um, special special. Um, uh, it looks like that is uh, particularly engaging and leaves a lot a lot of discussion still open. So everyone are invited at TQ as uh, participants to the next conversations. Thank you very much to everyone to Angelo. Kaze Simon, Sam, and of course, uh, Alex, uh, and to all participants. Uh, thanks a lot, Alex.